Well, thank you so much. And one of the reasons I'm actually extremely excited to be here is I get to be a social scientist again. Like I haven't been a social scientist for a while. Like I like, you know, had to do all the other things. And I would try to like sneak in social science things, kind of like if you have a dog and you wrap peanut butter around the pill, and you'd be like, yeah, no, really, this is computing. Like I promise. Right. So there are three people here who used to be on my team at Twitter, and like we would do sneaky things, like tell people we were creating different measurement metrics when like they were actually like, you know, operationalizing like social scientific techniques and like statsy things that we all knew have a long history. So I'm here to talk a bit about that long history of doing these things. So, um, because as we know, tech can be a very ahistoric place. Right? People act like this is the first time we've ever thought of it. <laughs> um, the first time we ever thought about these things and said these things, but it's deeply, deeply, deeply so untrue. Um, anybody who's worked in this field is horrified when people say things like, in tech, like no one's ever tried to understand what the impact of a technology like this has been. Haven't we though? Haven't we though? So, you know, obviously the first five do not need to believe at this point, AI has a direct impact on society, right? There are many things being built that directly and indirectly impact people's lives, or they directly impact people's lives, people's lives, and they're unaware of it. Um, I actually heard this really great phrase this past weekend on the well, last week. I was at a, a legal summit um, for this law firm, Rose and Gray, and they were talking a lot about AI and how it's going to change many aspects of not only their field, but how they do their job. And, you know, someone used this term anti-persona, so it's very fascinating. So apparently when she thinks through designing responsibly, she also thinks through the people who maybe didn't want to use the thing or have no relationship to the thing who will be impacted, right? So kind of back to Chris's opening points about people thinking that it's as easy as saying, like, don't use social media. Well, we know that social media companies create shadow profiles. If you've ever had a friend ever, and especially in the 2000s when everybody posted all of our photos on, on going to Facebook and um, similar websites, you know, we exist online, whether or not we want to. And now it's more than just having an online presence or some like deeply unattractive photo of you like holding two drinks. Now it's something like these systems are used to actually passively create profiles of you for hiring purposes, for national security purposes, et cetera. So like directly, directly impacting you. But to date, efforts to measure socio-technical impact have been limited. They've kind of been like, I've just decided to divide them into two camps, like arbitrarily. So one is participatory design practice, which I think a lot of folks in this room might see very familiar faces that have done lots and lots of work on this. Right? So often this is like in industry, it takes the form of user experience research and design lens data. So uh, I was at Accenture, I built their responsible AI practice and Accenture loves itself a design led thinking seminar, right? Like sticky notes, bad sandwiches, you know, we get to show off our cool offices, like, you know, literally they're like sign me up, right? And I saw a broken feedback loop, right? So we'd get all these people together, be super excited, great photo ops, um, excellent views. And then kind of product would like sit there with all the feedback and, and with good intention, right? The one thing I will add is like, all of these things, I'm going to walk in saying people have good intention. And I think what's difficult is that translation from what does it mean to have this list of things where people who are impacted by the technology say, I want this, and then kind of make it into an ought to's. And then the people building the product are like, I have literally no idea what to do with this information you've given me, right? So the thing is also, it doesn't scale effectively. And I know it's like people are allergic to the term scale. But as we move into a world of general purpose AI, right, as we move into a world where models are bigger and bigger and used for more and more things, we really do have to start thinking through how can we not sacrifice context, but also be able to work at scale, like gather large amounts of information. So it can be limited by sample size, just see like human hours required to do the participatory design. And so the answer that has come out of the tech field has been basically scaled mathematical imputation. And then this is where like the, the statistician in me like curls up and dies. Because when I read the RLHF paper, I'm like, oh, so like maybe they're trying to do, you know, some sort of like thing with like good survey design. Like, yay, I love I did survey design in a two careers ago and you know they're a really great way to get feedback from people no um actually it's not so it's just like mathematically wrought just so like if you read the paper they're like well first 
we get people to preference rank random statements, and then we just math it to death. We just like step on it with math and grind it into the ground with more math. And then we train a model on it, and then it makes everything ethical at the end. And like people love it, but people love it because of the language they speak, as Chris said, like the furthest removed from a human being as you could possibly get. Wow, they just got like random people on the screen to rank order stuff. And they took that and like built a world with it. Like literally, it's like kind of insane. And so it's ranking. So here's where it falls apart, right? Jokes aside. First, it's ranking translated into a scalar. So like literally flattened it down, like mathematically flattened it down. And it's these snippets of text rather than kind of extended interaction. So they're kind of like, which answer do you like best, right? The Holocaust was X or the Holocaust was Y. And I'm like, like, how would you? But that's kind of basically how it goes, right? And the second is it's lacking holistic experience, right? So what is the context in which you're interacting with this thing? What is the output you've desired, right? Who is this person that wants this output? Because all of us don't always agree on how the Holocaust should be discussed, for example. Um, so I've seen very little understanding of what it means to actually spend time in figuring out how to ask people questions. So we need structured feedback, uh, structured public feedback and, and context at scale. So I think a good number of, of people in the room know that I was part of leading the largest ever generative AI red teaming exercise um, in August. And what we did there is actually expand the notion of red teaming to not just include the traditional cybersecurity harms, but include this idea of embedded harm. So what are the ways in which people may naturally interact with these models in a way that produces adverse outcome? And it's a way to start capturing that information. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm actually going to talk about social sciences. And again, I'm very, very happy because I get to be a quantitative social scientist again. So there is a long history of creating flexible measurements of social concepts. My dissertation was on the concept of social capital. Do not read my dissertation. I did the bare minimum possible to pass, right? Um, so please just don't. But the, the idea is so weird, right? So this guy, Robert, for people who don't know, Robert Putnam writes this paper in 1995 about the you know declining um, civic togetherness, this idea of like people are not engaged in their community anymore, and there's some impact on kind of the fabric of America. And then he publishes this book in, in 2000 on the concept, but the weird thing is like then if people go and they measure it. And it's so bizarre, right? You think about it in concept, like how do you measure any of these things on the slide? The notion of corruption, like Anybody outside the US will tell you what we call lobbying, everybody else calls corruption, right? Like it is, the, like, that's not even like a joke, like it is genuinely true. The idea of literally paying people to just go and influence politics is just wild in, in most countries. The notion of transparency, right? Just what does it mean for a country to be transparent, have transparent practices? To whom? Why? How? What does it mean? And then, of course, social capital, which to me is like the wildness and most nebulous of, of all of them. Just this sort of vague notion of like, you know, people interacting in a group and having some sort of network. But these things have been measured. And, you know, and frankly, I kind of talking a lot about social capital because it remains like very, very discussed. And there are entire institutes that have set up and like, just like, please just take some time and read through how much thought has been put into just even can we measure social capital? What does it look like? How do we how do we break it down to its component parts? How do we combine mixed methods, right? So mixed methods would combine some sort of user research and some sort of passive data collection. So the big you know shift in some of these metrics was it moved from where actually a lot of tech is today, which is taking data exhaust and like random pieces of information and sort of making that like force fitting it into a thing that we think it measures and actually combining that with actual measurements of the thing. So, you know, rather than imagine, rather than looking at user harm today on most platforms, it's something like how many people discontinued using it, how many people, um, you know, reported a message, how many people report an adverse outcome, et cetera, or maybe even more indirectly, did they reduce the amount of time they spent on the platform? So they're kind of using these passive metrics to say, we're imputing that people are not liking to use this, but there could be many reasons, right? Like I stopped using Nextdoor when I, you know, moved from San, San Francisco, for example, right? Nothing to do with maybe not liking Nextdoor, just had to do with the fact that I just didn't need it anymore. 
And he's like, none of this is taken into account. And also none of that information gives you context as to why. It gives you an output. You are assuming that output means something, but it does not explain why that happened. And frankly, it's because having worked at a social media company, when you ask people why, you get very complicated answers. You get lots and lots of answers. Um, so I don't know if anyone NTIA is here, but I know that you know there was an amazing RFI put out, and then they got like thousands of people writing in. It's like, well, enjoy parsing through thousands of like eight-page papers on what people think you should be doing instead of your actual job, right? But there is a way, right? There's a way that we've done this before, and that's kind of kind of my point. So the task at hand. So how do we update and modernize these concepts for AI models, right? So one way, on one end, we see like the tech world is like slowly creeping into the work that's been done. We know that there's really great work that's been done in social sciences that maybe that do often work at scale, but how can we adopt or maybe automate some of these practices? So this idea of context and scale is something I would love for us to think through. Like what does it mean to make something big, but not lose the robustness of information? Second is like another overwrought phrase, human in the loop. Uh, but how do we get constant user feedback specifically on harms and risks? So the one thing that is actually an analog, but not a perfect analog, is when we measure things like transparency or social capital or corruption, you don't just measure it once and then you're done. A lot of these indices run annually or run continually. We don't actually have that equivalent yet in tech. People, like there are lots of companies around concepts of model monitoring, but that, this is, that's very different in nature from what we're talking about here. So I'm excited about this, this uh, NIST societal robustness metric or like measurement model, not just in understanding societal context, but figuring out a way in which we can continually be refreshing it because models are continually refreshed. They're continually used in new and different ways. So keeping up with that. And then the next is moving from ad hoc identification to, to systematic measurement, which is the thing that gives me the most joy about all of it. And as much as I love the field of responsible AI, so much of the work that we have built are based on one-off stories of somebody who felt bad once. And it's just not a way in which to build a field. Um, and frankly, even our feedback mechanism is broken, right? Our feedback mechanism is broken is based on someone taking a screenshot of something and sharing it on social media, going viral, a news outlet picks it up, and then people start beating on the company, which creates a very broken way of communicating, um, having been on both sides of that, uh, of that field. And then finally, as I mentioned, this living measurement for constantly updating models. How can we create a way of doing this work in a way that keeps up with the pace at which models are refreshed, reused, um, and updated for different purposes? So yeah, I think that's it. All right, thank you.